Thanks, Anna. Um, wow, it's bright enough. So since we're all still enjoying the Olympic fever, um, I'm sure all of you've heard of the Chinese swimmer Ye Shivan, who won the 400 meter race by swimming faster than her male counterparts. Um, and almost instantly, she was accused of gene doping. Daily Mail, of course, had its signature headline, genetically modified athletes forget drugs. There are even suggestions some Chinese athletes' genes are altered to make them stronger. Another headline recently that caught my attention was about designer babies. An Oxford professor saying genetically engineering ethical babies is a moral obligation. And these mad scientists created artificial jellyfish from rat hearts. Um, there you see, uh, it's called medusoid. And slowly, ever so gracefully, is going to start floating in its little water incubator. Free swimming medusoid, made entirely from proteins of rat's hearts. In yet another headline that recently got my attention was about genetically engineered mosquitoes to invade Florida. There's a British firm called Oxitec, and they are re-engineering these mosquitoes to be able to cure dengue fever. They tried it out in Cayman Islands, and it was extremely successful. Obviously, the residents of Florida are not quite so happy about this. Um, but much like Margaret Atwood's World of Oryx and Crate, these stories of genetically modified humans and chimerical animals sound like elements of a science fiction novel. And that's because these sort of stories um, are edge cases. They challenge our ability to put things into neat categories. Is it machine? Is it natural? Is it artificial? Um, a common thread that runs through all the stuff these stories talk about is that they use DNA. The, and of course, our flesh and blood, the very stuff we are made of as our raw material. We are constructing not only ourselves, but what would be natural around us, plants and animals, just like we might construct chipsets or political systems. We are creating a new genre of hybrid objects. Of course, this sort of modification of biological organisms is not new. I don't think many, many of us even remember what, what a wild chicken used to look like. Um, and then, of course, there are these atomic seas that you might have heard of, hugely popular post-World War II, when they were bombarding plants with radiation in a hope to produce disease-resistant wheat, more sugary sugar maples, violets with three heads, and so on. Um, that was in 1950. In 2012, uh, at Superflux, we have our own set of atomic seeds. If you'd like one, come and say hi later, and I'll try and give you one of those atomic seeds. Um, Unintentionally, too, we've seen modifications in the natural world. These seemingly beautiful illustrations of bugs by Cornelia Hesse Honegger are, in fact, mutated bugs from near Chernobyl who've been exposed to radiation over years, resulting in mutations such as asymmetrical wings and eye cysts, almost as if they are prototypes of a future nature. And of course, we've not spared ourselves either, creating hybrid humans, more commonly known as cyborgs, or cybernetic beings with both biological and artificial enhancements. In fact, if the idea of using a machine to enhance our biological cells could be described as a cyborg, then these cyclists might as well be cyborgs. I think we are now living in, in, in the, the, uh, the concept of the word cyborg is a lived reality. Um, I don't think they are thinking, I'm on a machine and I must remember to pedal. I must pedal, pedal constantly. Um, living with machines, using machines to enhance ourselves is, is, a, is very much a lived reality. And if that is the case, those news stories, what's so special about them? Why are they so relevant today? Um, I think there are a few things worth considering. Well, one of the things that we should think about is the way these hybrids are made. For instance, with Oscar Pistorius, you kind of know where you stand. Even if he did accuse Alan Oliveira of using longer blades and having a distinct advantage because of it, I think they're fighting over something that's quite measurable. When it comes to drug doping, you know what the control, you have control, you know what the input is going to be and what the results are going to be. But when the capability is not manufactured, when it's designed to grow inside our bodies, when we can design and edit living organisms, that's the sort of thing that makes us perhaps a little bit more uncomfortable and confused. For instance, this fantastical animal was imagined by Albert Secker in his Cabinet of Natural Curiosities, 
known as the spider goat demon. Not quite so demonic, this is Freckles, the first generation of transgenic goats. Before she was born, she had spider genes added to her genome, which would produce spider silk that has, it has incredible value because it's so strong. And they wanted to produce it in large quantities. So now this goat's milk has spider silk genes in it. Um, the other thing worth thinking about is the intensity with which these technologies are becoming accessible and open source. For instance, these are more than 1,500 undergraduate students all over the world working this very minute to design new biobricks to submit to the iGEM competition, also known as the Olympics of Synthetic Biology. Essentially what they do is they're trying to build simple biological systems from standard interchangeable genetic parts and so operate them in living cells. The resulting DNA and data strands are submitted to an online catalog uh, or a registry which keeps hundreds and thousands of these genetic parts which can again be used to produce more biobricks. For instance, in this, uh, a team have designed the E. coli bacteria to work as a photoreactive film. So the E. coli bacteria responds to red light by changing the color and images projected on the, onto these colonies will become fixed, in this case creating a portrait of Albert Einstein. And so, I think the question that one wants to ask is what happens when what is perceived as nature merges with science, technology, politics? What sorts of new categories of things will we, will we need to design? And when the techniques to make them become increasingly easy to access, who will be designing, manufacturing, and distributing these things? Like the cyborg was for the 20th century, what will be the prototypes for this new 21st century nature these questions interest and excite me as a designer because I want to be interested in playing a role in shaping this new world. And that's what we do at Superflux. We are a small design studio. We work with in emerging technologies and try and find ways in which they intersect with our everyday lives. We work with technologists, scientists, economists, social, social scientists um, to explore the uncertainties and unknowns that arise as a result of these new technologies entering our everyday lives. Um, I'm going to just show you a few projects very quickly to get a sense of sort of stuff we are doing. For instance, as Anna men mentioned, one of the projects that we are currently working on is around the idea of restoring sight to the visually impaired, to people who have a special condition called retinitis pigmentosa. Um, the idea behind, and the way the scientists are working to restore this vision is through the use of a combination of gene therapy and optoelectronic prosthetics. Uh, and the science is called optogenetics. Uh, I'll play a short video which shows um, how it's being used. Patients with retinitis pigmentosa go blind because the light sensitive cells in their eyes are dysfunctional. The remaining circuitry is, however, intact. In 2003, the discovery of a special light sensitive protein in algae led to the new field of optogenetics. We can use these special light sensitive proteins to bring back some form of photosensitivity in the remaining cell layers of the retina. My team is developing a special optoelectronic headset to interpret the world and communicate with these newly light sensitized cells. It is our hope that with a mixture of optogenetic gene therapy and our headset that we can return lost vision to these patients. So that's Dr. Patrick Degenau who's uh, adopted a very scientific approach to try and restore sight to the visually impaired. And um, one of the things that they were trying out was what sort of vision will people get when they do start getting their vision back? Um, they created lots of image augmentation concepts, uh, outlines of uh, objects that you might start seeing, even Tron-like vision, um, and tested it out with lots of patients. Um, they felt that it would be better for people to start seeing at least something as opposed to being completely blind. Um, however, much to their surprise, when they showed these concepts to people, they were surprised because people said, I'd rather be blind than have my world look like this. As scientists, they were approaching it from a very data-centric perspective, um, whilst as designers, we are thinking more about the sort of experiences that we will have and what it will feel like to live with this technology. While science and engineering eliminates what is possible, how can we as designers zero in on what's preferable? And that became the starting point of this project. Um, we were interested in what sort of 
when you, it's almost like literally plugging a Scott lead into your head. And when you do that, what sorts of visions might you start seeing? Could you potentially start seeing in the electromagnetic spectrum that is not normally visible to people who are quote unquote normally sighted? And um, we tried to do that. So we acquired lots of specialist equipment, camera equipment, and went out and started filming these different spectrums to get a real sense of what the world might look like. Um, and I'm gonna show you a couple of video clips. Uh, one is showing um, vision, ultraviolet vision, which is used by bees and butterflies to, go, um, to navigate their uh, way around nature. And lots of flowers have adopted to become more attractive, uh, to look more attractive in the ultraviolet uh, spectrum. Um, another, another clip is um, showing uh, near infrared where you start seeing landscapes as sort of snowy, um, beautiful snowy landscapes rather than green. Um, so yeah, I'll just show you a couple of clips. Hey, how's it going? Good. I just wanted to check if we're still on for tonight. Uh, sure. How does half six sound? Perfect. Uh, I'll meet you at the station. Sure, great. See you then. Bye. In the next clip, I'm going to show you how um, this person starts exploring the world in the far infrared, in thermal imaging world, and also a little bit of augmented reality uh, in a not Google Glasses kind of way. I've got to cut that, cut that short because it's a long clip. But um, the idea behind this work is that it is, um, uh, while we are kind of at the edge of what uh, new nature might be, we are, it's, it's very much grounded design work. So you're designing the vision, you're designing a new kind of prosthetic vision, but you're also designing the sort of objects, the devices, the apps that people will start using to navigate this new world. Um, and, 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 and how do you design this sort of stuff at an ecosystem level? How do you package this technology in a way that will be meaningful and, and help people um, navigate this, uh, this new world? Um, another level of engagement as a designer is to challenge ourselves by exploring alternate pathways for a near future. 
For instance, a lot of our futures, individual future, futures are anyway locked in this whole idea, dream world of having an exotic holiday somewhere one day or having freedom for mortgages and so on. But, uh, but as a collective, as a collective group of people, what, what is our vision for the future? So, so I put an open call out and invited people to participate in this project called Power of Eight. Um, over several workshops, eight of us attempted to build an optimistic vision of, the, of our collective future. And whilst it was our hope to create something optimistic, what emerged was perhaps a slightly more problematic vision, uh, a haunted alternate ecosystem of strained machines and modified nature. Um, just one of the things that was uh, invented by the group of people was called the Beamer Bee, or the synthetic bee, which is supposed to cure this whole problem of co colony collapse disorder and disappearing bees. Uh, the scientists in our team designed this thing called a synthetic bee by taking plasmids from different creatures and putting it into the embryo of this uh, normal bee to create this super bee, the synthetic bee that is going to pollinate all our crops. And we started imagining these sort of idyllic scenarios of families having these beamer bees in their gardens to pollinate and grow crops, or you follow, or, or they're glowing in the night, so they're following people home on their way, um, way, way home after a romantic evening out. Um, children might even start keeping glowing bees as pets. However, concurrent to our sort of utopian visions are darker possibilities. We all know about the idea of militarization of animals. For instance, the American army actually created this thing called the bat bomb uh, by attaching incendiary devices to bats, and the idea was to drop them over Japan during the World War II. Unfortunately, they could not use the bat bomb because the atom bomb was invented just then. And then there's the dolphin, which is used to locate underwater mines. There are, there are uh, defense personnel around the world at this very minute who are using the idea, uh, who, who, are, who are toying with the idea of using miniature drones disguised as bugs or insects for spying purposes. For instance, within DARPA, there is a project called Hybrid Insect Micro Electromechanical electric, electro Systems, where they are secretly designing all sorts of miniature drones. So what's stopping them from trying to make an entirely natural, artificial, synthetic bee drone in the, in the months to come? And that's where it starts becoming interesting for me as a designer. Because it's quite terrifying, yeah, interesting. Um, it's, it's, it's exploring a space where we are going to have to deal with these things and we are going to have to start taking notice. Um, I, 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 I strongly believe that speculative design can be very useful as a genre in this space. It can help people suspend disbelief and start looking at these new realities today. Um, for instance, in another project, we are exploring some of the complexities that actually happen when these technologies rub against um, our sort of ideas of ownership and capitalism. We all know about CD Greedy Monsanto. Recently, uh, there was this, um, they were awarded $1 billion due to a patent infringement for a product that was never on the market. Um, there's currently an ongoing battle between uh, the US Supreme Court and Myriad Genetics, a company who's trying to patent two breast cancer human genes. Uh, genes that they discovered in some people and they want to patent them. So who owns our genes? Who can patent them? Will we have patented children? And at the other spectrum, will we have pirated children? How will our healthcare models adapt to these new changes? How will we value human life? In our ongoing project titled Genetic Stock, we are designing a scenario where genome sequencing, profiling, and modification have become the norm. In this scenario, we are exploring the potential health care costs of gene combinations. For instance, this, al this algorithm that we are designing calculates insurance premiums based on specific gene combinations and their associated risks. For instance, in this chromosome number nine, there is a high risk of Alzheimer's detected which could potentially increase this individual's premium payments. In the coming months, this will be developed further, so keep an eye on our website. But to conclude, in many ways, I think this talk is a rallying cry for designers to think about a new space for design, a liquid space, a space where you might have genes, you might 
have genes, you insert genes into living organisms, but then they mutate and you just don't know what's going to happen. Let's start dealing with uncertainty through design. Let's use this opportunity to invite people to slow down, to be more deliberate and conscious about what's happening around them, rather than having big companies like Monsanto take control of the situation. Situating ourselves in the heart of legal, political, economic implications of a world where flesh, blood, and DNA are used and abused, we can play an important role in continuing to explore what it means to be human. Thank you.